Hello everyone. Thank you for attending today's Diatom Web Academy to hear about my thesis research where I constructed a voucher flora of diatoms from fins in the Tanana River floodplain, Alaska. This research was conducted at Ball State University Biology Department under the advisement of Dr. Kevin Wyatt. To begin, I will briefly cover some background information on diatoms and then introduce our project design in Alaska. After that, I will walk you through the methods and analysis, then I will discuss some of our findings, and lastly, I will go over some of the broader implications of this work. Diatoms are unicellular, microscopic, golden brown algae. They are notable for their beautiful and unique cell walls composed of amorphous opaline silica. They are primary producers that provide energy to the base of the food web and generate as much as 20 to 30 percent of the oxygen in the air we breathe through photosynthesis. They can be found almost anywhere there is water, including moist soils, free floating in open water, and attached to substrates in marine, brackish, and freshwater environments. However, each species have specific range preferences and are very particular about the quality of water they live in. Because each diatom species have distinct ranges in which they can grow, they are useful as bioindicators. Each species are sensitive to many environmental variables such as pH, salinity, and nutrient concentrations. Since different diatom taxa occupy varying ecological niches, identification is key for using these algae in biological studies. Thankfully, diatom cell walls are ornamented by intricate and striking patterns in the silica, which is one metric we can use to help us with species level identification. Diatoms are diverse and ubiquitous, with the estimated number of species ranging broadly from 20,000 to a possible 2 million species found globally. Not only are they easy to find, but diatoms preserve well over time, which makes for great taxonomic records in sediment cores. An accepted technique for verifying diatom identity in biological surveys is to create and maintain archives of voucher specimens to use as reference guides. Traditionally, this was accomplished by depositing permanent slides with circled specimens in public herbaria. An herbarium is a collection of preserved specimens and their associated data, which are often housed at universities, museums, or similar repositories. An advantage to this method is that a record of preserved specimens provides a means of comparison that may be essential for studies in taxonomy, systematics, ecology, and many other branches of scientific study. However, it is time consuming, labor demanding, and costly for research teams to document individual diatoms among hundreds on a slide, so not all specimens may be circled, which leaves the record incomplete. Another limitation is that traveling to herbaria with a large algal collection may not be feasible for everyone seeking to view a species. Emerging methods aim to reduce the limitations of traditional methods. A voucher flora is a document that records specimens through images, their nomenclatural designations, and creates a visual record for a given project. They are created before identification and enumeration of diatoms begins. Prepared slides are examined for the entire project with a goal to image at least 50 to 80 percent of the diatom taxa collected. The images are grouped into operational taxonomic units, OTUs, so that analysts may collaborate and discuss species boundaries before finalizing the OTUs for the voucher flora. Because they are collaborative at the state of development, they align taxonomists' morphological understandings of species boundaries and serve to coordinate all analysts working on the project. This process improves accessibility, providing a venue within and between labs for taxonomic discussions and interpretations. It also facilitates consistency in taxonomy over long-term ecological studies that may span many years because the voucher flora is archived as a public permanent record. 
Archival of permanent slides in herbaria remains important, but images of voucher specimens are more practical, publicly accessible, and less expensive to maintain than circled specimens. A species list often accompanies the diatom voucher images and may contain additional information. For example, the full scientific name of a species which includes the authority, the dimension range of the species or other morphological metrics, the reference to the images of the species, the habitat the species was collected from, the sample accession number in herbaria, and information on the current threat status of the species. Red lists are an inventory used to track biodiversity loss and evaluate extinction risks of a biological species. However, there is no diatom red list for Alaska, the United States, or North America currently available. Thus, referencing diatom red lists for Germany can help further the conversation around imperiled diatom taxa and the urgent need to conserve their habitats. Information regarding diatom taxonomy is not evenly distributed, with some regions being better represented in the literature than others. Boreal regions of the United States are especially underrepresented given the amount of open water areas present at northern latitudes. In Alaska alone, open water environments make up more than half the state's total surface area, and 85% of that are considered wetlands. Boreal peatlands, which are a common type of wetland habitat in Alaska, form through a complex process which allows for peat to accumulate due to the slowed decomposition under cold, nutrient-poor, anaerobic conditions related to water saturation. These peatlands take thousands of years to develop and are critically important in global biogeochemical cycles. Despite known links between diatom community structure and ecosystem function, research examining freshwater diatom communities in these wetlands lags behind that of other aquatic ecosystems. This research expands our knowledge of regional diatom biodiversity. It provides a verifiable taxonomic source for inland Alaskan diatoms, and it updates and builds upon Fogad's broad treatment of Alaska published a little over 40 years ago. The overall goal of this research is to evaluate diatom communities across a range of peatland types in interior Alaska to build a regional voucher flora that may be used as a diagnostic tool for linking diatom communities to environmental conditions. Therefore, the study objectives were to image all specimens and build voucher plates. Then to identify diatoms to the species level and create a taxon list. And lastly, to document all red list taxa along with any potentially new species. As I walk you through the methods, I will use this overview of the major checkpoints in the process to building a voucher flora. The next three slides highlight the collaborative effort of our lab to travel to Alaska to collect and then efficiently use all of our field samples. This project was conceptualized while travel was restricted due to the COVID-19 pandemic, so I couldn't go there myself at the start. But thankfully, our lab had preserved specimens that were maintained for the purpose of future algal taxonomic composition projects like this one. This study, which we have named the Alaskan Peatland Project, was conducted in a wetland complex in the Tanana River floodplain just outside the Bonanza Creek Experimental Forest, 35 kilometers southeast of Fairbanks in interior Alaska. Mineratrophic peatlands with distinctive vegetation communities and water chemistry are referred to as fens. Each fen site selected was classified prior to this study, defining the gradient using natural transitions in vegetation community structure and water chemistry. The fins in our studies were not directly connected, but were located within one kilometer distance from one another. In the months of May through August of 2017, each fin type was sampled every 10 to 14 days. Each of our study sites consisted of four one meter squared plots divided into four 25 centimeter squared subplots. 
Loosely attached algae and periphyton were collected from the peat surface via a plastic syringe. Then, using a toothbrush, attached periphyton was scraped from the submerged portions of four stems of the dominant emergent macrophyte. Samples from each of the four subplots were composited into a single vial. All contents were homogenized to make a single composite sample from each plot per fen per sampling date. The samples were preserved in 2% formalin solution and transported back to the lab to be stored for later processing and analysis. A total of 72 composite samples, or 24 per fen, were collected over the 2017 growing season. At this point in the process, the composite samples collected in the field were ready to be chemically treated to prepare for diatom analysis. Prior to identification, the composite samples were acid cleaned with boiling hydrochloric acid to remove organic matter from the diatom cell walls, and then the acid was neutralized by a series of distilled water rinses. The acid dissolves all the organic materials, leaving only the silica valves intact, revealing the unique characteristics that allow for diatom identification. Cleaned concentrated diatom valves were dripped onto three separate cover slips per sample and then allowed to air dry. Then each cover slip was visually inspected for the appropriate density of cells and then permanently fixed to microscope slides using a high refractive index mounting medium, Nafrax. At this point in the process, the diatoms were ready to be inspected and imaged at the microscope. Throughout this talk, I may use a few terms specific for diatom taxonomy. When I say frustule, I'm referencing an intact diatom cell composed of two valves, illustrated in gray, and one to several girdle bands shown here in light blue. Also pictured here are a few more examples that aid in identification. Symmetry is the first step we use to separate groups. Then we may look at other morphological characteristics, such as valve shape, apices type or tip shape, central area shape, and striae pattern. Notice how many combinations could be made and how subtle some of the differences between species may be. Diatoms do not always mount in an image-ready position. As you can see here, they may be in valve view, girdle view, or three-quarter view, which is undesirable for building a flora. Valve view is the desired position for imaging and identification because it offers a clear view of the rafe, central nodule, areola, and striae. These are just some of the morphological distinctions that allow for separation of taxon to genus and then subsequently to the species level. Position isn't the only thing that matters when looking for diatoms to image. Because diatoms reproduce asexually throughout much of their life cycle, a size diminution series known as an operational taxonomic unit informs taxonomists. The representatives selected for voucher imaging should be the largest individual encountered, a few intermediate individuals, and the smallest individual from each species. As I worked through imaging the slides, I took measurements of diatoms using the graticule at the microscope, looking for that variation in size. I found it helpful to keep a sketch journal as I worked to track information such as slide ID, fin type, date of collection, specimen measurements, helpful references, and tentative identification. While attending Ecology and Systematics of Diatoms at Iowa Lakeside Lab, I learned how to confirm my microscope measurements using ImageJ software. Having precise measurements of length, width, and striae density in 10 micrometers is a critical step in species identification, particularly striae density, which can be determined by counting all the peaks on the graph. For example, within the genus Tabellaria, each species have subtle differences. Though length and width ranges may have some overlap, Tabellaria flocculosa have a hyaline gap in the striae of the central area and form zigzag colonies. However, Tabellaria finistrata do not have a hyaline gap and form linear chain colonies. Here I have pointed out just a few of the morphological characteristics I used to separate to the species level. 
notice that the colored images are straight from the microscope in the raw stage. To be measured in image J and eventually used for a voucher plate, I needed to learn how to use photo editing software like Photoshop. Each image had to be rotated, cropped, accurately scaled, and edited to uniformity without distorting the diatom valve itself like the gray scaled images here. To give you an idea of how much editing I have done throughout this process, I started with roughly 1100 raw images. We calculated similarity in diatom community composition between all site pairs using the Sorensen coefficient on presence-absence data. This quotient of similarity ranges from 0 to 1, high values indicating very similar species composition between two sites. A recent study comparing the performance of several similarity indices found that the Sorensen index was the most useful for analyzing binary community data common in community ecology. To review, all the composite samples collected in the field were chemically treated in the lab. Then clean diatom valves were mounted, measured, imaged, edited to uniformity, and tentatively identified. At this point in the process, all edited images are ready to assemble onto voucher plates in their respective OTUs, after which point taxonomic identity may be reconciled before compiling the final species list. A total of 184 taxa from 38 genera were identified to the lowest taxonomic level possible. Initial species identification and nomenclature were assigned following European-based literature. However, refinement and reconciliation of taxonomy followed local literature of the United States and Alaska. Approximately 11% of the documented species across all fens were potentially new to science. Using the Sorensen coefficient based on binary community data, 41% of species were similar between the rich and the moderate fen. 37% were similar between the moderate and the poor fen, and only 27% were similar between the rich and the poor fen. 25% of the species identified matched those considered near-threatened or more imperiled status on the diatom red list. Roughly 900 images of specimens allow for taxonomic verification and improve accessibility. These 25 plates of specimens grouped into OTUs align taxonomist morphological species concepts, which is especially helpful for long-term research. When taxa are not documented in a voucher flora, future investigations are often faced with extensive post hoc harmonization, which may be required to reduce data errors, usually at the cost of losing species information. Out of 184 taxa documented, 11% do not appear to be formally described. We assigned these taxa a provisional name, rather than a formal name, to aid in future investigation enumeration processes. To formally describe a novel species, more investigation would be needed and should be pursued for future investigations. Within the genus Tabellaria, two taxa appear to be new to science. Our understanding of the species concepts within the genus Tabellaria follows the variability noted in the United States, but both of these taxa fell outside the variation for any species described in the literature. For example, the valve morphology of Tabellaria species 1 APP falls consistently outside the variation having clear asymmetry. Tabellaria species 2 APP lacks a noticeable central inflation, which is not usual within the genus. As mentioned earlier, we analyze the species presence absence data to compare the fens. The most prevalent genera in all peatland types included Tabellaria, Eunotia, Pinularia, and Gomphonema. Tabellaria was common in the rich fen, but gradually became less prevalent in the moderate fen and was sparse in the poor fen. In contrast, Eunosha showed the opposite trend. Though Tabellaria flocculosa was the most common species in the rich fen, 
Eunosha pseudoflexuosa and Tabularia finistrata also frequently occurred. The moderate fen also supported a diverse assemblage of diatoms, with Pinularia pultra and Eunosha pseudoparallela being common. The most speciose genera found, Eunosha, had the greatest number of distinct morphological forms across all peatlands, with the greatest concentration occurring in the poor fen. The species most frequently encountered in the poor fen survey were Eunosha nigelli and Eunosha mucophila. I wanted to know how similar the Alaskan peatland project species list was with other recent U.S. taxon lists. By comparison of the taxa encountered in this study with recorded diatom species from selected southeast rivers in the United States, 78% were dissimilar. By comparison with the species from the continental United States checklist, 60% were dissimilar. And by comparison with the species checklist of the diatoms of the northwest United States, 53% were dissimilar. Of the 25% matching those on the diatom red list, I will highlight five species that were frequently encountered in our fens. I compared these species with recent U.S. checklists from the continental U.S. and the northwest United States. I also looked for these species on both the 1996 diatom red list and the more recent 2018 diatom red list to see if the threat status of these species had changed over time. For 44% of the species encountered in our study, the German red list had not evaluated their status. In Cyanema possistriatum, was described from Finnish Laplands and has been reported in Sweden and European Alps in oligotrophic waters. A recent study recorded populations present in wetland habitats on the tundra of Nunavut, Canada. This taxon was not listed in recent U.S. checklists. It was reported as highly threatened in 1996 and rare in both of the diatom red lists. In Cyanema neogracil has been most recently recorded from lakes, fens, and mossy seeps in the mountains of Northwest United States. On the Northwest U.S. checklist, 169 total prior records detected populations in California, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Washington, and Wyoming. This taxon is reported as presumed endangered in 1996 and reported as threatened in 2018. This taxon is a great example of how voucher floras allow for taxonomic discussion and interpretation and help align taxonomous species concepts. Specimens in the literature with similar morphology to these were reported as Gomphonema hebridense, but none of the specimens bear resemblance to Gregory's original drawings of G. Heberdense published in 1854. The specimens do match the original descriptions and drawings of G. Lagerhemii in A. Cleave in 1895. G. Lagerhemii, reported as G. Heberdense, has been described as a northern alpine species in Austria, Germany, and Finland. More recently, populations of this species were found in floating mat fins in the Indian Meadows Research Natural Area near Helena, Montana. It was reported in the Northwest U.S. checklist, occurring in low numbers in nine streams in western Montana and western Oregon. This species was reported as declining in 1996 and reported as very rare and highly threatened in 2018. Cobiacella parasubtilissima was found associated with sphagnum species in Scandinavia and later was detected in low alkalinity lakes in the Northeast United States. More recently, it has been recorded in weakly acidic to somewhat alkaline fins in the Northern Rockies. It was reported in the Northwest U.S. checklist in Montana and in Washington. This species was reported as declining in 1996 and then reported as rare and near threatened in 2018.
Stenopterobia delicatissima has been reported as widespread only in acidic waters, but rare elsewhere in Europe. In the Northwest checklist, it was reported from Montana, and in the continental U.S. checklist, it was detected in southern Alabama swamps, colonizing the mucilage of Ophridium, where it was found to be abundant. This species was reported as threatened in 1996 and reported as rare and highly threatened in 2018. This study identified 184 taxa from 38 genera. It expands regional knowledge of diatom biodiversity to include a gradient of peatland types, home to many potentially rare, threatened, and new species of diatoms. 11% of the taxa documented in this work are potentially novel species, which highlights the uniqueness of peatland diatom communities. It provides nomenclatural designations that correspond with this study, serving as a diagnostic tool for future investigations into these taxa. When the Sorensen Index was applied to our binary community data, Differences in community composition between fin types accentuates the potential biomonitoring power of diatoms when applied into these unique wetland systems. 25% of the species found in these fins matched those on the diatom red list. These findings emphasize the need for future investigations into the status of potentially imperiled U.S. species and the development of a diatom red list for North America. The distinctiveness of peatland habitats, meaning the rarity, stability, and extreme conditions, has been shown to explain the high concentration of unique vascular plant floras, including rare species restricted there. Similarly, these unique conditions have been shown to support new species and rare diatoms found in peatland floristic studies. Some diatom species have adapted to withstand selection pressures of fins such as extended periods of desiccation, thermal fluctuations, low nutrient concentrations, particularly nitrogen, and low pH. For example, genera like Eunotia and Pinularia, commonly observed in this study, were previously found to exhibit higher species diversity in wetland environments. Inconsistent taxonomy when using diatoms as a proxy threatens accurate assessment of biotic condition. Transparent taxonomy through accessible voucher floras promotes more correct and consistent diatom data. As a public permanent record, a voucher flora facilitates consistency in taxonomy over long-term ecological studies that may span many years. At the beginning of this talk, I outlined the objectives for this research to first image all specimens and build voucher plates, then to identify diatoms to the species level or lowest taxonomic level achievable in order to create a taxon list, and lastly, to document any rare or endangered red list taxa along with any potentially new species. Documenting the species richness of diatoms in the boreal wetlands is necessary to understand the spatial distribution of algae across the boreal landscape and to place the experimental work within a larger context. Therefore, the overall goal of this research to evaluate diatom communities across a range of peatland types in interior Alaska, to build a regional voucher flora that may be used as a diagnostic tool for linking diatom communities to environmental conditions has been completed. Renewing commitment to the development of region-specific floras is imperative to better understanding the biodiversity of diatoms, the ecosystem services they provide, and their application in solving ecological problems. Despite diatoms being acknowledged as important for biodiversity and species richness assessments, there is still a need for further investigation into their role as bioindicators in these unique wetland ecosystems. The data presented here could be used to expand species concepts, distribution records, and autocological information relating certain taxa of diatom with environmental parameters of fens. 
At its core, this regional voucher flora is designed to be a tool. It is part of a collective effort to provide accessible taxonomic resources of localized areas to support wetland conservation. Early in this talk, I explained that due to the COVID-related travel restrictions, I could not go to Alaska to collect my own samples, but hope to pay it forward one day. I am happy to have been afforded the opportunity to experience field work in Alaska this past summer, collecting samples for upcoming projects in the Aquatic Microbial Ecology Lab at Ball State University. I'd like to draw this talk to a close by encouraging everyone to check out the Voucher Flora Archive available on Diatoms of North America, where I am proud to say that this research is available alongside many other recent Voucher Floras. Of course, I want to take a moment to acknowledge all the support I received from both individuals and organizations. Thank you all for believing in the quality of my work and for supporting me financially. I would also like to thank my co-authors, Dr. Kevin Wyatt, who has led by example, working tirelessly alongside me throughout this process, and Dr. Allison Rober for academic, professional, and personal guidance during my time here at Ball State University. I also want to acknowledge all of the support and encouragement I received from Dr. Sylvia Lee, Dr. Kalina Minoylove, and Dr. Paula Fury, who have done countless virtual appointments sharing their expertise with me. Lastly, I would like to thank all of you for your attention. I am happy to take questions at this time. Excellent. Thank you so much, Veronica. Thank you. Thank you for a really engaging talk. And um, just I want to commend your work on um, developing a voucher and making everything accessible. Thank you. Um, it's, I think that that's really the way to go um, as long as we can share everything with each other. And I, I put the link to your voucher flora in the chat so people can access that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. And um, if people have questions, you can um, raise your virtual hand or you can type it in the chat. And maybe while you're thinking about that, um, I have a few questions. Um, I'm really interested in what happens in the fens over time, over the over this you know, ice free season. Do you okay. see a change um, in assemblage? Well, um, the samples I looked at are just during the growing season. So they are from May to August of 2017. Um, my lab does go back to Alaska every year and they're always working around that area. They aren't necessarily always doing a project over in those fens, um, but they are all going out there. They were out there this past summer. Um, so research coming out of our lab from Dr. Rober and Dr. Wyatt, um, as well as many students, um, kind of covers a broad gamut of all the different things that uh, our lab looks at. Um, <clears throat> recent studies we've done have looked at um, trophic interactions. And um, I believe some of the research we've looked at like carbon cycling and things like that that are happening through our lab. So um, there's lots of stuff that was kind of outside the scope of my research on like how the fins are interacting with everything, but yeah. Um, I wish I could say that I could go back and look at like how this diatom assemblage is changing from year to year, um, but that's a longer study that I, couldn't do in a master's program. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in your use of the the red list. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what do you think would it would would be required to develop a red list for Alaska or for any particular state? Um, how do, how would you go about doing that? That's a really good question. Um, 
So I think we would have to follow what they've done in Europe and their standards as like a baseline of how to like survey each state. Um, I know it would be a big effort. It would be very collaborative. Um, and I think going out and surveying and finding which species are prevalent, which species are rare, um, looking at a lot of different habitats. Um, when I was reviewing the German red lists, I noticed that they were looking at every kind of habitat that a diatom could occur in. Um, so I think that that would be like critically important to get teams together to like focus in on like what it would take uh, for, for each state to develop one. And then all of the states coming together for like the United States red list. Um, of course, we could make it the North American red list and include Canada and any other species in North America that um, would, I'm stuttering over my words here for a moment. Um, but I think it would be very collaborative. It would take a lot of effort from everybody. And I think having a platform like Diatoms of North America could help with that. Um, but yeah, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm interested how it would, what could go about in being, um, it sort of leads to another question of just what is happening to these fens mm -hmm. uh, and the change in climate? Are they um, flooding more, drying more, more extremes of each, or do they, does a rich fen become a poor fen over time? What are, how are they, what are those dyna dynamics in terms of the, the fens? Yeah, so what we are, talking about within the lab different discussions we've had is you know they may kind of degrade over time and start to look more like those poor fins uh, they have looked into like how permafrost thaw might start to impact um, those areas especially in the northern regions um, as far as what i saw in the difference between the communities i saw uh, tabularia um, kind of grading into um, from the a lot of prevalence in the rich fin to like moderate pre prevalence in the moderate fin to almost never being encountered in our poor fin samples. But then Unosha showed this opposite trend where we had a lot of diversity in Unosha species, but they were kind of taking over the poor fin. There wasn't a lot of other species in the poor fin and they kind of graded in the opposite direction. So we would still see those in the uh, moderate fin and we would see a few different types of species in the rich fin as well. Um, so I think it all kind of depends on each species tolerance and uh, some of the dynamics occurring in the fins. Um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of conversation to be had with how climate is going to impact these really unique wet, wetland systems. Uh, as far as the scope of my research, I kind of tried to stay away from climate as much as possible. Um, there's so much more I need to learn about that area. So I don't want to comment too much on it. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else? Oh, um... Let's see, Sydney says, amazing job, Veronica. Your work you, in the fens um, is amazing. I want to ask you about the potential use of the rich fens sampled in your study as being a reference site for other fens. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you consider that a, a reference condition and are these sites protected? Um, so the sites that we are working in are protected. And as far as like, if I would consider the rich fin a reference site, um, I'm not really sure. So we did have discuss discussions about like what we've seen in the rich fin versus the moderate fin. And both of these fins had a decent bit of biodiversity, but their communities were a little bit different, which is what we saw with the Sorensen coefficient. Um, so I think that it, it could be a good place to start, um, but I wouldn't, without really assessing it, I don't know if I would say for certain that the, the rich fin is what we want. Um, and I think that over time, you, 
the moderate fin is probably a more achievable goal. That's what I'll say. <laughs> so am I, what do you, you, you mean that the moderate fin is, is pro the least impacted in some way or, or, or what do you, can you clarify that? Yeah, so I think that the moderate fin, uh, the rich fin has a lot of plant diversity that um, the moderate fin had a little bit less of. And uh, yeah, I I don't know if I, I didn't go too deep in like the dynamics of the fins. So I don't want to, um, I don't want to comment too deeply on the dynamics okay. of the fins. Yeah. Sorry. I really focused in on each of the, the species and uh, learning about what each of them wanted. Um, because throughout the time at Ball State, you know, I, uh, it was during the pandemic and I started, like, I was only going in there by myself and I started thinking about each of these species as my new friends. Um, so I learned about, you know, what each of them liked and our fins do have a lot of acidophiles in there. Um, so it was really interesting to learn about the different Eunosia species and the different, um, Cavalaria, we have those really interesting, um, I think, new species. <laughs> um, and they were really exciting to find there. So um, hopefully, and I would love to look more into this myself, but hopefully in the future, we can learn more about those species. Do you have a um, pretty good ra size range of them? Are they some of those really weird looking Cavalaria for sure? Yeah, um, so what I showed in the slide um, is all I have of species one APP. Um, species two, I had a much larger size diminution series and that's available in uh, my publication. I had to kind of cut that down to fit it in the slide. Um, but I think with that one, you could really see a grade um, where they got smaller and smaller, but with that, species one, it, it kind of the smallest one was the clearest one. And I would love to go back and get more. I would love to get SEMs of those and just see how very different they are because they tend to have like this asymmetry happening where the central inflation wasn't necessarily right in the middle of like it typically is with Tabularia. It was kind of lower. It appeared to have like a head pole and a foot pole. And so it was a really, a really interesting one. And um, I wanted to learn more about what it took to make a, a species, a new novel species publication. And I really got to have more images of that, you know, <laughs> I would like to have at least seven really good light microscope images. And then I would love to get in there and get some good pictures with SEM. Um, but I did get an opportunity to check out an SEM lab um, when I was at the North American Diatom meeting. Um, so that was really, really cool. Got to uh, look through and see how the process is done. And I would love to learn more about that in the future. <laughs> great, great. Um, yeah, well, I hope that you continue um, with this work. Um, it's really important and few people are working in Alaska right now. Um, so it's great to have some understanding of of those habitats. Um, well, I don't see any other questions um, coming up. Um, so let's see, I just want to be able to, um, get over to our um, schedule <laughs> and see what, what's coming up in two weeks. Um, we will have, um, Ruchi Bhattacharya, University of Waterloo, will be talking about lake dynamics in a changing world. So please join us for the next Diatom Web Academy. And please join me again in thanking Veronica for your presentation today. It was great to have you. <laughs>